This is where all the councils were. It was, it was large. There are a few uh, uh, little state markers that know the area. I'd heard quite a bit about it. It became Lake George after having been called Lake Osakramont. Mm-hmm. See, that we consider this the front of the building. Now, this one has I just thought it was a light. Well, but no, there's oh, those figures were removed as they were as uh, in reverse. Particularly so. But, uh, For tonight, Sir William Johnson has announced the betrothal of his son, Sir John, to Mary Watts. Is that him playing the violin? Mary, the girl in the rose-covered gown is immediately in front of you to the left. Oh, in the green, huh? Watts. Sir right there in the green. There left, beside the little table, Holly Johnson is working at her small table loom. Her husband, Colonel Guy Johnson, Sir William's nephew, stands at her shoulder. On the settee to the left is Governor Tryon and his wife. He is chatting with Sir William. Standing behind Sir William is Colonel Edmund Cannon, Governor Tryon's secretary and son-in-law. The group is complete and continual by York Philip Telemann. Sir John Johnson is playing the harpsichord tonight, while Peter, son of Sir William Molly Grant, and Daniel Klaus, Sir William's deputy and son-in-law, play the violins. Dr. Richard Schocker, former secretary of At, at the Battle of uh, Lake George, huh? The Battle of Lake George, actually, though, it was a culmination of many other services they rendered the king, mm -hmm. we feel, but uh, yeah. uh, it was a direct result of Lake George. We had the original document upstairs in the mansion up until a few months ago, but the uh, uh, facility in, uh, in Albany, the state facility, took it, and they promised to return it. Well, we hope they do, because when they take anything from up here, we usually don't give it back. But it was an original document making way of uh, a baronet. And the date says, he looked, and there was two large portraits, one the same one in, uh, in the hall, and there's one at age 40. And you can uh, compare the way he looks in the two, and you can see he went downhill. Now, he was not a well man anyway in Europe, though. Uh, it sort of carried over to this country. That's an interesting uh, little more uplift touring site like this. It's sort of a depressing day, but I think you'd enjoy it if you stay in the area. I don't know. You'll the, um, you had the Hurons well, the and Hurons, some of the wet, Western. Godwins. They were, uh, they had a big war there back in long before William came over. Mm -hmm. The Algonquins were like, um, it was almost like a confederation like the uh, Iroquois. The Mohegans were part of that. Of course, the Mohegans and the Mohawks never got along. Letters do not have five of his original possessions. For Fort Johnson has, like Bonnie said, 14. And he had a lot of Indian artifacts up there on right. the... Trying to emphasize that more and more. Because there was a terrific Indian influence in, in the house. I'll bet. That gave him a lot of land, huh? Well, he didn't not. He wired himself in the... Oh, he could have said no. <laughs> <laughs> he could have said, well, <clears throat> that's okay. Uh, I got enough, you know. He was a... <laughs> he was probably one of the largest landowners in, uh, in North America at that time. He 
was one of the most influential white men. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. The books, uh, none of these books actually belong to William, but we know that he he read like editions of these. And all the books disappeared after the end. Let's get a better angle of this here. We can come and see this.
Oh, you'll have to do. I'm standing here on the site where the front, uh, Seneca villages existed that were burned by the French in 1687. And this started a long relationship, hostility, one nation toward the other. Uh, it was an ongoing process. It never, uh, it's hard to say who started it. Because one side did one thing, then the other side had to reply like and kind. So this here was just seen as a punitive expert, uh, expedition against the Seneca Indians for uh, raids on the frontier or uh, attacks into New France. It was not, you know, just some conquering thing, but it was more uh, like what we would call police action, where they came down here to give them a message to stop attacking.
the fresh settlements. Down here, I'm facing toward, now that d directly ahead is Lake Ontario, about another 25 miles. And this village here is on a hill, protected from flooding, whatever, and there's nearby creeks and streams and things. This was the main Seneca, uh, capital of the Seneca Nation. It was right here, this town here was centrally located. There were other Seneca towns, but this, this town here was located right in the heart of everything. And there were 150 longhouses here during the time it was um, attacked by the French. Rochester, New York's just do that way. This is the battle site here where the the town was surrounded by a stockade like they like they did. It's a very large town, 150 longhouses. For, for an Indian town. This town here was supposedly where the League of the Iroquois was, was formed. A lot of the great counselors that f formed the Iroquois Nation were from this village right here. This is where a lot of the negotiations to form the five nations occurred. The Seneca, which was considered the western door of the Confederacy, were one of the strongest nations, and they had absorbed many other tribes, probably the most populous of the, um, of the five tribes that originally um, comprised the Iroquois League.
constructed the, when they restored this place in the 1920s. They sort of thought...